six o'clock with the meeting going. Please stand and say the pledge with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> So we're going right, Sean. Okay. So before we're before we get going, I've got something I want to say. Um, a couple of meetings back, we had some very obnoxious chats come across. I, I went back and read them. Um, we hold our kids to higher standards than that. And if the adults can't figure out how to get along and be civil, then they're going to get shut down. We've had uh, somebody call in and, and there were some chats under a certain name and they said, that's not me, I'm, I'm not on. So in a couple of weeks, what we're gonna go to is you'll be signed up, you'll have to sign up for an account. We'll get the information for anybody that wants it and it has to have a, a valid email and or phone number, a verifiable one. And as for the chat feature, I figure we'll go probably the first five or maybe 10 minutes. When we're done with uh, uh, hearing of visitors, if if we're not past that 10 minutes, we're done. We're gonna shut the chat off. I don't wanna hear or see. And anybody that's dropping F-bombs or anything, uh, I'll ask Sean or Blake or whoever's here to, they're, they're gone or for the night. I don't know if we can ban them for whatever I'd love to, but. So that with that said, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, right to communications. So it's not often that we get to do show and tell at um, our board meeting, but I'm gonna pass the down um, and this down. So I have a letter here from Steve Roth, who's a principal architect for Architects West. Dear Superintendent Ellis, it is with great pleasure I can inform you that the new Prosser High School project has been selected for the publication Endeavor Business Media's American School and University 2022 Architectural Portfolio. It is being featured in the November December 2023 edition of the magazine and online at schooldesigns.com. This marks the 40th year in annual competition honoring education design excellence with 94 projects chosen for publication. I've enclosed copies of this publication as well as a plaque for your district. I can speak both for myself and Architects West when I say we have truly enjoyed serving the Prosser School District uh, and to improve the educational facilities for their community. As always, if you have any questions or concerns in the future about any project uh, we have assisted with or any questions in general, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or other team members. Congratulations, Prosser School District. Sincerely, Architects West Incorporated, Steve Roth, Principal Architect. So, I think congratulations, Go to this community. They, uh, they passed the bond. We had two or three dozen different people sit on the committees and help decide what was getting done. So good news, pretty cool. Anybody want to look at it? <laughs> oh, I didn't realize it didn't make it that far. Yeah. Pass it on around, guys. That's okay. All right, so then we're on the information items and apparently it's board appreciation month. Yeah, so I've, uh, we have uh, little notebooks here and pens for uh, the board members. Um, to appreciate them and our student board reps as well. So I'm just gonna read part of this proclamation from Jay Inslee. Um, Whereas the mission of Washington's public school system is to ensure that all students achieve high levels and possess the knowledge and skills to be responsible members of a democratic society and enjoy productive and satisfying lives. And whereas Washington's 295 locally elected school board directors and nine elected educational service district boards are the core of public education governance systems in our state. Serve more than 1.1 million students, have a combined annual budget of over 15 billion, 
and employ approximately 120 people. And whereas school boards play a crucial role in promoting student learning and achievement by creating a vision, establishing policies and budgets, and setting clear standards of accountability for all involved. And whereas school board directors are directly accountable to residents of their districts and regions, serving as a vital link between the members of the community and their schools, and whereas the boards and ESDs provide a passionate voice for advocacy for public schools and the welfare of the children, and whereas it is appropriate to recognize school board directors as outstanding public servants and champions for public education. Now, therefore, I, J. Inslee, Governor of the State of Washington, do hereby proclaim January 2023 as School Board Recognition Month. Um, so, uh, the proclamation, uh, thank you for your ongoing service. Um, I can speak for all of us to say we really appreciate it. Um, your your vision, your advocacy, uh, your assistance in helping us run the district. So thank you all directors and student board directors. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you guys. None of us could do it by ourselves. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so next would be instructional materials committee membership. This was yours, Deanna. So we're, we are in the process of beginning um, review and adopt, well, not really review, adoption. We don't have really a lot to review for 6 through 12 ELA. Um, our teachers from the middle school and the high school, the administration principals, Principal in addition, plus the uh, rest and then um, the whole parents that are participating uh, that will be participating in the process. So um, Matt asked her to bring it so that you could, could see it for information. We'll come back to action at the next time because the board has to approve it. Okay. Thank you. Was there anybody signed up to address the board? <clears throat> And anybody that's on Zoom, you got three more minutes before, until we're done here. Thank you. All right, so just because I always forget, we'll get it out of the way now. You may present a concern to the board during the time reserved for hearing a public comment. If this is the case, we ask that you, number one, prior to starting the meeting, sign in. Note the topic you intend to address, to address the board. Come to the microphone. State and spell your name. Do not reflect adversely on political or economic views, eth ethnic background, character, or motives of any individual. Uh, please keep your comments concise, non-emotional, and brief. The board is interested in hearing your concerns as well as your compliments, too. It is best to call the superintendent's office a couple days before the meeting. If that is not possible, you can ask to be recognized or sign in. And first on the list is Monica Niemeyer. Yes. Thank you, Nolan. Oh, thank you, Nolan. Um, first of all, Andy, um, thank you for talking about that and doing that. Um, I know we all have hard conversations with each other, and I know it can be very difficult. But the fact is, is that we try to listen to each other and be heard. And the fact that someone abuses that platform and does it anonymously and says things is honestly not the way to do it. It, it doesn't help anyone being involved. That anonymous hiding and saying things just is a recipe for disaster later on and causes hurt feelings. Well, we so, can't figure out how to be so-called grownups and, and have disagreements without throwing things. Exactly. So stay home I just, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, I'm sure everybody who probably sits in this little hot seat and talks to you guys probably feels the same way. It's hard to talk and to be heard. So I do appreciate wanting to keep a level ground on that. Um, I just wanted to talk about the meeting on the 28th and the 30th. I'm not sure if you guys were aware, but um, I had a couple of people reach out to me and ask about it. And when I went back and watched the video in the 28th, it's, it's muted. Part of it is when I come up to talk um, it's, it's muted and you, you can't hear. And then it comes back. I'm not sure much later on. So they didn't, we have individuals who weren't able to watch and, and hear everything going on. On the video for the 30th, that one's actually very unusual. Um, it skips Andy to write when you the action item, the the discussion when we when we talked about the voucher and 
um, the process and things like that. None of that's, none of that's there. It just jumps to you. No, I don't know. It's just somebody talks to you just saying, huh? I can answer that. Oh, okay. I want to be accurate that it did. So our system is set up to automatically start recording. But because that was an unusual Zoom meeting and I was running it from my office, I sat it up early to make sure everything was good to go. And then I forgot to start the recording. So it did. We missed, I don't know, to be honest with you, I don't know how much time we missed. A few missed. minutes. Couldn't have been. Yeah. In the yeah, I was going to say it's only 15 minute meeting, I think. I didn't uh, start the recording. I'm sorry. Oh, well, yeah, as you know, I'm Mr. Tech, so I knew, and so actually, yeah, I actually thought it was you first because I remember you going, Did I hit this right? Am I doing okay? But, um, I just wanted to, to ask if I let you guys know about that. I had people at, reach out to me, and so I'm hoping they also reached out to the district to be fair. I believe still in the district, but we don't have a Zoom recording of that first few minutes, okay? Okay, and then my um. Only other question was, um, I did see in the vouchers where um, it, it's a voucher for the re reimbursement, I hope I'm saying that right, um, for Matt's uh, PhD. And I know that's in his contract. And at, at this time, you know, that that can't be argued um, until it's until it's reviewed, I guess, with by boards above you. Um, but I do have a couple questions. If I recall, I think that was back in September. Um, Elisa Riley had a couple of questions. Sorry to put you on the seat, by the way. And maybe Jason did too. A couple of questions about um I can't I couldn't find it in in the meeting, but it was I think pretty basic questions like um how many credits did you need? Where were you at? Were any of these um credits that you were taking over? Kind of what the plan was for that part of his education. And I don't think those questions were answered, and we're coming up now on a on the second reimbursement. And was just wondering if those questions had been answered, or could we could we get answers? And, uh, that was it. I don't remember what the questions were. So to be fair, okay. But yeah, I could work with them on that. That's what it was. So okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you, uh, Grayson. Uh, picture. Oh yeah, bring them on up. Glad to have you back. By the way. Could you be sure to give us your name? Oh, I'm Grayson Stockdale. Okay. I didn't work like I thought. Uh, so the last time I was at a board meeting, I talked about my fundraiser called Playgrounds for Prosser. And I am back now to update you on how it went. So um, I raised around $940 for just the playground equipment for the schools here in Prosser. And uh, this was thanks to various generous donations from many kinds of people. Um, and this was enough money, money to get a portable volley net, volleyball net, a ring toss game, two sets of bases, two chain nets, two soft nerf footballs, three normal footballs, three size three soccer balls, four Velcro catch games, four buckets of chalk, four kickballs, five basketballs, nine jump ropes, 14 four square balls and 18 size four soccer balls. And I would like to once again, thank all the people that donated any money or helped in any way. And uh, this will help the kids at Keen Riverview Heights and Housel have a good time at recess. And um, this just goes to show just how much the community here in Prosser agrees that the students here at Prosser School District deserve better when it comes to recess. I think this was an amazing first step, but it was unfortunate that it was even needed. Um, it is my hope that uh, the district will take the immediate next steps necessary to provide the schools with with a better uh, playground and to finish making the playgrounds as soon as possible. This was an eye-opening and wonderful experience, and I thank you for having me here tonight. Great job. Well, Grayson, I, I saw you on Heights and Review and the middle school social media thanking you with these great pictures and just great work. Yeah. Thank you. I got to say, Grayson, you rock. There's 30, 40 smiles in these pictures, and they're all because of you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say great job. What an in initiative and great job. 
I'll tell you what, you got to be pretty puffed up right now. <laughs> You're next. All right. Um, uh, President Howell, board, thank you very much for having me. My name is David Stockdale, um, father of Grayson who just spoke. And yeah, I'm uh, very proud of him. I really just want to hammer home. It was all his idea, his effort. He went, knocked doors. He went to the, he went to multiple Walmarts and sporting goods stores. He went to businesses in the downtown, uh, Northwest Farm Supply, Cooks or Ace, they hang, they put up flyers. I mean, it, the community was 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 rallied around him and his efforts, and um, I was happy to uh, donate the gas and Dad taxi to take him around. So it's it's pretty exciting stuff. So really proud of him and the work that he's that he's done. And um, so um, last time uh, he was here, I was here. Uh, we we provided uh, to the board some some information, national information, uh, re, uh, information from the state's office of the superintendent regarding recess, open play, those kinds of things, and the benefits of that, what it can do, uh, not only health wise, but uh, the positive impacts that it has in the classroom and for the education uh, of our students. Um, I uh, I'm here to to kind of see what sort of efforts have have occurred or in the last uh, three months. Three, we were here at the end of October, so about three months or so, um, just to see if uh, what what if anything's been done there. I've I've had an email. Uh, I was, and I'm very uh, zealous and direct uh, in that, but I wanted to just uh, follow up on that uh, here and publicly as well that. Um, very happy to to volunteer uh, to lead whatever effort might be necessary uh, to to assist this board to assist Superintendent Ellis and anybody else that might be a part of that. I have um, you know fifth, uh, over sixteen years of public service experience, almost all in leadership, and um, uh, the cities I've worked for uh, quite literally tens of millions of dollars in grant funds. Very experienced through those process and happy. Very familiar with the nuances associated with all that as well, so I'm very happy to to volunteer uh, for the schools to do that. Um, um, still have a good relationship with the city. Happy to go meet with them as well. I think there's some great opportunities for partnership there, uh, uh, as they're all community spaces, all own uh, public resources. Um, I do uh, want to address some very basic things right now, just to bring to the attention. I'm not sure where the hangup is on on a couple things over at, at Keene Riverview. You know, the students um, don't have access to open space. They don't have access to the, to the grass areas. A lot of it has to do with some construction and, and mud and things like that. And I understand that. Um, but we've been told since about November, early November, that um, we just need to get some mats laid out there so the kids can run around and, and walk on the mats. I don't know if it's get something to do with mud, get mud off shoes, whatever it's been. It's been almost three months and the mats are not out. That seems very basic and I don't really understand the reason why staff is telling us well it has something to do with the union and only the maintenance workers can do it o okay so talk to whoever you need to talk to let's get the mats out I don't know why we can't be on the grass because students can only be on the blacktop and they're not allowed to run on the blacktop so you have kindergartners first graders and second graders not allowed to run for three months during recess I mean this um we should we should be upset about that and so um we, whatever we can do to to let our our young students run would be would be very much appreciated. Um, uh, you saw the pictures. Balls are donated uh, today. Those balls, a lot of them, not all of them, are over a fence into an enclosed area. They were there when we picked kids up from school. They were there when we came by this uh, on our way here. My kids tell me that they've been there all day, and so. Whatever we got to do, paras, whoever out there, if the balls go over the fence, can we please get them back? We have new things for them to play with. We hope that they can play with it. So I guess, so my follow-up questions on, on all of this is, is uh, what do we need to do to, to make this a priority? I recognize you have several priorities and you're balancing budgets and you have a lot of things to work with, but I do think this should be a priority. There's there's lots of data. It's backed by scientific data. There's lots of good reasons why we should we should do this. Um, some of those I mentioned before, risk versus reward. These are all things that they need to learn, interaction, socializing, all these kinds of things. All uh, plus just, you know, uh, my 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 first grader has more energy in an hour than I have in a year. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So we got to get some of that stuff out. So I, I again, I, I, I'm here to offer um, services to lead whatever effort might be available out there. I'm happy to put a uh, citizen involved committee together. I'm happy to work with whoever I need to work with wherever it needs to be and, and, and make that time available. 
And I just wanted to make sure that this important priority of the services that we provide to our students isn't isn't bypassed as we work on other things. That's all I have for you today. So um, I can I can kind of uh, clarify a couple of the points. Um, the I heard today about the mat issue. Um, we had an administrator out. I don't know the pathway or the chain that that's flowed through, but being in the building today and being around kids and and kind of working in that office area, somebody brought that to my attention. Uh, notified the maintenance. They said that they would have it done tomorrow. Appreciate that. Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, we did sign up for a grant subscription service. Um, our principals will be working with that. Deanna, I know, has has been trying to identify some grants as far as that. We're also waiting and, and we're hopeful um, that the contingency funds after Whit Strand, we're hoping that there's some funds left uh, that we can invest in brand new equipment. Um, and then it, obviously as the playground starts to open up and Fowler returns uh, the, the property kind of to us and uh, pulls down those fences, uh, the students will have more open space. And so, Deanna, I don't know if you have anything to kind of add to that. Yeah, so we were hopeful that the project would be reached by Christmas. Not quite finished yet. Sure. So we don't have the closure on any contingency remaining either from Riverview or, or the Heights. Um, regardless of that, there probably will have to be a, some commitment from the board for funds or grant funds found because I don't think it'll be enough to do the project, especially at Riverview, because it's a pretty big project. Um, there, I we did have our um, clear risk playground expert come down and just for people's peace of mind, there is no issue with with Strands playground. We went through and reviewed that, so it's when it's staying intact, so there won't be an issue there. Um, but but KRV is an issue. And, um, you know, I know Jesse, Jesse and Jody are both working to find ways to find grants, but none of that is fast. So I, my hope is, and I know it's not a short term fix, but <laughs> something really fast. Um, but the maps, yes, but then spring is going to come and we're going to have to get, you know, grass down seats and probably close off some of those areas again to get that in good shape for, for the kids for, for the fall, but getting the mats out there will help. Um, I don't know why that's taken so long. I, I, you know, but I'm sure Matt will make sure, I'm, I'm sure maintenance will get that done because he has to get that done so the kids can be out and play on the stuff that is out there because there are quite a few pieces along the fence line that kids could play on um, that are still available, so. The, I do like the partnership angle that you had mentioned. I know that in Pasco School District, um, they open up their playgrounds as public parks on the weekend and let people access them with their dogs and things like mm -hmm. that. So that's a cooperative between Pasco School District and the city of Pasco. Um, and there's some shared maintenance there. And was so I was the consultant that helped write the intergovernmental agreement between the city of Pasco and Pasco School All District right. on that. Yeah. And so um, there's a lot of, so yeah, best practices, the sort of the understanding is uh, we're all stronger together, the combination of resources, and these are public spaces, and yeah. what sort of, it always comes down to, it's always attorneys and insurance, right? So liabilities in contracts and setting those kinds of things up. And so uh, for the most part, um, there's general recreational immunity that's out there, and people recognize that there's inherent risk associated with monkey bars and things like that. So the same thing goes for ball fields. And so as, as, as those agreements are, are, are set up, uh, those spaces can become open. I, I, I wanted to say that, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm hoping for. I'm hoping as, as you go through your supplemental budget and budget processes that there's an earmark there that there's a recognition, at least, that there's going to need to be funding for a match requirement for some of these grants. Uh, being a rural community, those are usually somewhere between a 50% and 30% match, uh, depending on the on the granting source. And so there's some really good opportunities for that there. You know, one of the things that frustrates me to no end uh, in my career is when in public meetings, as people bring a, sort of a bag of of problems without solutions. And I'm, I'm trying to not be that. I'm trying to be here with some some opportunities and some ideas and solutions available for you. And I think that there's uh, quite a bit of folks is, like I said, that was 100% Grayson and his effort and it didn't take any arm twisting at all. The community, I think, supports these efforts pretty strongly. Well, uh, I'll reach out to you and uh, start to generate a conversation. It sounds like we're on the same wavelength as far as thinking about, you know, what's been done in different communities and different districts to 
enhance resources and extend the reach. Um, so Sounds thank great. you. Thank you. I make a comment on considering playground equipment. Um, would it not be like prudent for us to identify the equipment either desires or needs get a cost on what those equipment pieces will need then we can go look for the money because right I, unless you guys have it I, I I don't know yeah no that'd be a a fun um, a fun way to get students engaged to say here's you know and you can do it with like a thermometer right like here are the here are the pieces of equipment this is how much money we need allocated um, so they say that they lost their big blue um, mm -hmm. three slides and a little worm climbing worm mm -hmm. thing, and then the swings. But you know, um, risk management doesn't like swings. That's their least preferred um, piece of equipment, just because they have the highest danger, yeah. highest risk of injury. Um, they they do, um, and there's a lot of rules that if you do have swings, that they need to follow that on none of our equipment <clears throat> because it was old. So um, a large climbing structure um, would probably definitely be something because the kids love love those things. Um, and then some of the you know if there were you know some of the you know little tubes to go through and slides. But I'm the large climbing structure is what's going to be really expensive. You were I, talking about I, engaging students. Well, with students voice, right? well, yeah, but I mean, I I feel like we're talking about dollars when we don't even know what we want yet. So it's a big it'd be right? it'd be like. Well, I got 10 grand. I'm going to go buy a car, but what car? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So if we could identify the, the equipment needs, yeah. figure out how much that costs, and then let us figure out how to pay for it or, yeah. you, you know, do grant funding yeah. and stuff like that. that. So. Well, and to be back off that, like what, how we're approaching the stadium is what can we bite off first and right away? Is there something that doesn't cost a ton of money that we can get going right away to get to something? And then what is the dream? What is the ultimate goal? You know, if this would be great to have, but this is what we can afford today. So if we have a tiered option um, so that the community can see we're trying to address this right away and we have bigger goals. Um, the challenge on at Riverview, at least is a portion where Big Blue was and the slides is that once we put something in and we put the surfacing in, then we would have to destroy that to put anything new in. So that's the only challenge, that's the challenge I see with that kind of thing. But there is a whole other area where the slides were that could be in that phase, or the swings that be in that phase. So, so, so technology on uh, playgrounds has gotten really, very good. So uh, most of the time with, with swings, for example, uh, it's all about fall protection, mitigation of risk. Um, and so there's two main technologies out there. They come in tiles. And so um, that are uh, anywhere from two to four inches, depending on what your need might be, uh, which are usually curved in and, and based and compacted and then put in there. And Or there's other newer tech out now at trials downs like concrete. So it comes in uh, bags and mixes in a wheelbarrow, whatever you need to do, and you can trial it out and it cures. And so when there's maintenance, when those crack, when they buckle, when they do whatever they need to do, or if you're going to be adding new equipment, they're actually relatively easy. You can generally cut them out pull out what you need, install what you need, and you can actually take what you cut out, like almost like saw it with grass, where you kind of cut it out, put it back, and re-put it in, uh, especially the stuff that's in there for a trial. It's really cool stuff. Um, the, uh, so, you know, I go to the National Recreation and Park Association every year, go to their vendors uh, stuff they have. It's just unbelievable, really cool tech out there. Um, they have, uh, there's lots of other grants and things like that available too. Uh, you know, Little Tykes and uh, Bueller and all these other pro, uh, rec companies are there. They'll be happy to sell you something, but they, they, they also usually will be able to match to a certain extent. Uh, if you come up with some, they can come up with some and they can go get other funds there as well. They have really strong foundations and donors. So yeah, you're not, you're, you're right on, on all of those Absolutely. issues there so like we had already that was already paid for like that was already part of the project so we do have servicing there but that that setup isn't going to the buildings would like to have an inclusive playground mm -hmm. and um, that won't work for an inclusive playground so maybe at least part of the project could be an inclusive playground which would be awesome okay. is most of the playground at Riverview then going to need to be replaced well it, if you drive by there, you'll see the like concrete barrier. It's mm -hmm. in there. That okay. means that's where big blue, there were big blue three slides in that too. And then how much will heights do you need? Heights has a much smaller Are, area. Much, we have, yeah. And so we actually aren't kind of looking that much mm -hmm. because we, if we can get some freestanding, that's what was in there just to kind of replace it. Um, 
I'd like to get the fourth graders something. We have those on this side a little bit better than what they have. But and I know that we switched from fifth, like third grade. Fifth grade is where third grade was, so they're a little bit littler. But yeah, Jesse and I are just texting right now, and it was we we'd really like an inclusive, ADA compliant playground. When we went and looked at buildings, um, we went to a building in Richland, and they had a was super cool uh, ADA compliant. And the new the new playground at the park in Prosser mm -hmm. and the city park is mm -hmm. ADA inclusive yeah. playground too. So maybe that's another resource to look at and start with. Yeah, right. Now the last two parks we built in the last three years, they're all ADA accessible. They all meet ADA standards, property grading, drainage, so on. It was Pasco, which is perfect. We look at Pasco. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have no idea how to pronounce this. You, <laughs> Bron. You, Bron. If I wasn't far off, then. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my intention was not to put my name on that list, but now that I have the opportunity to address the board, I just want to uh, thank you guys. And also, I we moved. Me and my family moved to the community about two and a half years ago, so we're new to the area. But one of the biggest things that was mentioned tonight was, you know, having those hard dialogues and those hard conversations, as well as a collaborative effort to make sure that we push some of these agendas uh, forward. And, and how do we how do we move those to make sure that it's beneficial for everybody involved, whether it be children, adults or anybody in the community? Um, also, the power of community behind some of these efforts that we're looking to do, I think, is going to be super beneficial and a critical component of getting everybody involved because um, as it was mentioned earlier, you know, I'm new to this community. I came from the Tri-Cities from Pasco, um, very different than um, what I experienced over there. And knowing that my kids are going to a school that there's some need that still is is available to them. Um, I'm also right and I with um, Stockdale is that um, I can help in any way that I can and as being part of this community and being my new home. That's a huge part of why we moved here is that community, that power of the community and to move some of these agendas, um, agenda topics forward. So I appreciate the time. I don't want to take any more, but I didn't mean to put my name on there, but I'm glad that I had the opportunity. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Was there anybody that signed up late? Nope. All right, we're good to roll then. All right, so this would be student reports. We could pick. Eeny, meeny, miny, Christine. Noah, why don't you, will you move that back between all of you guys so everyone can hear? Yes, I can wait, girl. <laughs> I pretty much just wrote like notes of what was happening this week at school. Uh, we have an assembly this Friday with Stu Cabe, I think his name is. Yes. And I just kind of wanted to report what we're doing. And also, I don't know if you guys know what Wish Week is. Wish Week is also coming up. And then HOSA is doing like a fundraiser on first aid kits. So they're doing those for like sale and stuff like that. Pretty much all I got. Thank you. Thank you. What time is the assembly Friday? It's after, after the period. Okay. So it's like, is it like on a Wednesday schedule? I think so. so. It's probably about 140, 140 145. There you go, 145. Okay. Thank you. Duke Cape is great to listen to. I, that's what I heard. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's awesome. Which ones are you doing? Do you kind know? of. I don't know. So I've watched a handful of middle school and years. high school, and it's been probably 15 years since I saw him, but I still remember him. I guess you get a pick me Um, I don't have that much today, other than um, I've heard a lot about the new ELA curriculum adoption, and there's there's a couple concerns. Um for the ELA electives and whether or not those would be able to stay just because I feel like they're really important at the high school and they brought in like so many different things, your interests, possible careers, stuff like that. So 
I was just kind of wondering about that a little bit more. What are the electives? So there's like creative writing. What else is there? There's um, um, Heroes, Heroes in literature, literature, which I'm in that, and I love that class. There's mythology. Um, there's, lit. there's English literature. Um, there's also there's a um, few of them. So because that's something lit. we've talked about, and that's something that the teachers also, the high school teachers brought up and when we, we had our kind of preliminary meeting. So that's definitely something that's still on our mind. So okay. we'll we'll have more information on that as we move. Who teaches for Excuse me, right can now. the audience hear? Uh, I can barely hear. Joe. Could the audience hear what they were saying? Okay. All right. I could barely hear it. So. I feel like I was a little bit more quiet. <laughs> no, I, I guess that leaves me. Um, so I, I had a few things. Um, I'm really disorganized, so I didn't write any of it down. So I'm going to just try and go off the top of my head. Um, I had someone reach out to me today, actually a family friend who has a daughter in the school district who um, they're, they were trying to get accommodations for. She has a disability. Um, the doctor could not diagnose her without um, a concurring opinion from the school. And they have had that in process for three years and they just got it done yesterday. So this um, person who is very close to me, I love them, has had to struggle in the school district now going into their third grade year because there was no action moved forward. They weren't able to get a diagnosis. They weren't able to get a curriculum so that way they could learn. Um, so that, that's just something that needs to be a priority. It's horrible that it happened once, but it, it should not happen again. Um, because, I mean, it, it's written on, um, it's, it's written right here above the seal on investment for a lifetime. And if you're not going to invest in the people that need more investment, then you are not holding true to the standards that you have set for yourself and that the community has set for you too. Um, and then I had another one, a little bit more of a personal one, but um, reading through the care solace agreement, I think it's an amazing foundation. It's a great start, but speaking from experience, I know that this is not enough. Um, because I know that it is an absolute lie that it says it will quickly connect you with a provider. I had a doctor, two of them, write urgent notices that I needed in my life to see a psychiatrist and a psychologist, and I was put on a four-month wait list. So this, you might be able to see them immediately. That's not true. That is, that is not true, and that's not how this system will work. And if you have a student who is coming home telling their parents they're going to harm themselves, you do not have four months. You will be lucky to buy yourself four hours, and if you get to a hospital, you might have four days. So if you're going to put the system in place, you need to have the resources as well. You can't just direct them out of district and hope that they find the help. And you can't also have on here that you have, you're sending them out of district. You're putting this out of your control. How do we know that these students who are reaching out to us, knowing that we are trustworthy, us being the administrators or nurses or counselors or whatever it may be, how do we know that they're actually getting help? Because it's one thing to ask for help, but to get help is a completely different subject. You might have parents who are completely hesitant against the idea to take them to admit that they have problems, that they need help. So to put that out of our control and rely on good faith that they'll do their job as a parent is quite frankly, it's scary because I know parents that wouldn't. And that's a sad reality. And it's a really sad reality if you have a student who's telling you that they're being abused and they have to ask their abuser to take them somewhere so they can speak on it. And I can tell you a couple of things, Noah, that will maybe help you feel a little bit, maybe a little bit of um, peace. One is, if a student is 14 or older, they can reach out to the service and do that without any. Yeah, problem. I know it's a Washington state law. Right. Yeah. So the other thing is, is that um, administrators and the counselors um, and nurses are able to not see any, any detail, but see that a student has been connected with a provider and when they have an appointment upcoming. So they, we can see that in our dashboard. Not if you call yourself privately from home, but if you come into a counselor or principal and they they help connect you with the service, they can tell if you're getting service or not. They can see that. 
Okay. The other thing is, is I'm going to talk about direct services here in my report. I'll talk about that and hopefully that will help you with some, fill some a little bit of peace okay. on it. It, it does make me feel good, but I also want to just kind of push back on that just a little bit. Um, they, they, how often are those being checked? How often are our counselors looking at that to see so that they, they do have an appointment? Today. Okay, that's great. They we're just trained today, so to, that's why the letter is here. So we've had our administrator training, our nurses, counselors, and school psychologists were trained today. And so we can launch the program now that they've been trained. Okay, um, that was another thing. And I can check as well. Okay. I can check for the whole district. Okay, that was another thing. Um, how long have we had a school psychologist? So school psychologists in, at least for most schools in the state of Washington, they work in special education and it's primarily in testing and IEPs. It's not in psychology. Mm -hmm. Their scope of practice is not around therapy. A school psychologist is different than a yeah, therapist that you might see. At psychology a versus office. psychiatry. Yeah. So, they, so it's a little bit different scope of work. They deal a lot in assessment and diagnoses. Yeah. No, it was your question how long has it been since we've had a school psych yes. psychologist or psychiatrist? Yes. Uh, that was, I, we've maybe had I didn't school get that. psychologist as long as I've been here, um, but I'm not sure that's what you wanted to know. Or psychiatrist? We've never had a Do we have a student resource that they can go to someone who is medically trained and professionally recognized that they can deal with these issues? So we have. We have school, their school based counseling, which for most of what you're talking about is not adequate for no. the issues that you're talking about. We have one mental health person through comprehensive mental health that we have here on a limited basis. So, do we have someone? No. And that's what I'm going to talk about in my report about getting someone. Um, just until something further can be done, um, I believe I talked with Mr. Funk about this. They, um, that individual is in here at the high school once a week. Is that correct? So that that is what it's supposed to be, um, but there's been some challenges with that. They've been, I know, once a week at the middle school seeing students, um, but I think just this week actually is supposed to be tomorrow is the first day because it's a new person okay. it's supposed to be here tomorrow. Okay, um, because quite frankly, I don't know how long they've been in contract with the school district. I have not heard about them. I've seen them in passing and I've had that teachers say, who's that? Because you see a stranger walking through the yeah. halls and you get a little concerned. Um, if it's a resource for the students, why are we not informed about it? So the the students, the way the process works is the referrals are done through through the counselors. So if the counselors, because they have a certain scope of of the student need that they would see. So the average student coming in that might be having a challenge for the day or something that happened or broke up with a girlfriend or boyfriend and is upset, that is not someone that that person would normally see. Mm -hmm. the, the per, that person's going to see people that are referred that are having more of an ongoing mental health issue. Um, so it isn't a self-referral. Okay. So no, I'm not going to speak for the board or anybody at this end of the table. However, I think we all agree the Carasolis thing is not the answer. It no. is a tool at best. Mm -hmm. And arguably, maybe not even that good a one, but if it's all you have, it's better than nothing. Yes, I, I agree with that. But it's um, if you're trying to take a screw out of a piece of wood, you don't use a hammer. You work until you find a screwdriver or until you can get a power tool. Um, and I think that the school has the ability, or I would at least hope the character and the hope and the vision to find somewhere in our penny pinching budget to give students some help before we lose someone, lose someone else. Because if the school district is willing to take a, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest with you. I had this discussion with my personal therapist. She made $58,000 a year last year. Very underpaid, in my opinion, but I think that the school district can sacrifice in some spots to pay that salary compared to having to make a family pay for a funeral and then the years of mental health services for the parents afterwards for a service that could have been provided and um, that could have been prevented. So that's my little spiel about that. Thank no, you. No, I, I have one, one job now. I had a quick comment. I think everybody in this room would agree 
uh, our country, our state is suffering a lack of medical people. Yes. Ask any doctor, ask any nurse. I called to get, I was told to see a specialist. I called the first week of November and got scheduled for the middle of March. Yeah. That tells you how yeah. they're just so overworked. Mm. We just don't have enough. Yeah, and there's um, there's also a lack of um, spots, beds, whatever classification you want in Washington State. Mm -hmm. There's, um, I believe I talked with, I believe it was my therapist or maybe it was my actual doctor. I'm not 100% certain that there are um, very few beds um, less than 20 in the whole state that will take inpatient students dealing with mental crisis. Um, I, I'm, I'm not here to talk about myself, but I had to take one of those spots um, for a few hours. Um, and so it's, it, it, it's, it's very sad to see that at the bare bones, we can't get someone in here for them to talk to. You might, they, there might be students who will never tell someone that they need help, but they need help. Um, I, I just, I see it as something that's as much of a necessity as teaching us math. Um, because you can teach us multiplication, but if we're not here to do multiplication, it's just a waste. We do know I have one other service. We have prevention or intervention, and maybe you've seen that person. So if a student is dealing with substance abuse issues or even issues within their family, so we do have a person here at the high school that helps helps with that as well. You're right, though. Um, and I really, really appreciate your advocacy. And so we do live in a mental health desert, um, and this is an emerging issue that we we saw um, shades of it, I think, before the pandemic, but then coming out of the pandemic, because so many students were isolated, we now see huge numbers involved with it. And like uh, Director Howe had mentioned, it's not, this isn't, this care solace isn't an end in and of itself. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get, you know, it's it's a very it's a starting point, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so exactly what you're talking about and advocating for about like services, where do we find them? How do we find them? And in part of this is you were talking about the state, the state model isn't equipped to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And we're almost fighting over other fighting for these people for with other districts. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one of the pieces there, too, is that. You know, it's tough to find people. We'd even had a conversation, I think, at one point about trying to go in with local districts in our region and area to say, we need this person part time. Maybe, you know, Granby mapped in somebody else, Benton City. How many days can you use them? Let's split the cost of this and put somebody on contract that works between our districts. Um, um, so it it I really really appreciate your that student voice. You see it more than we see it mm -hmm. because we're you know so many times we're dealing with things at the policy level, and so we don't see what you're seeing. So you sharing that is so important. And and um, going along with being able to see those things, to me it might be easy to spot. To some of you it might not, and that's nothing on you. It's something you kind of develop as you go through these things. Um, you start to notice little signs. Yep. No one naturally wants to wear long sleeves in the summer when it's 116 mm -hmm. degrees. They do it to hide self-harm marks. Mm -hmm. So if you see 30 people walk into school holding their sleeves down like this, they might not be cold. Mm -hmm. They might need a little bit of help. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just something that needs to be worked on. And if it's a starting point, then we need to have a next point until we reach an end point. And one way to maybe get more people wanting to come here is offer them a really good salary. Sure. Um, I think on average in Washington state, it's about $110,000 or better. Um, so, I mean, you don't need to provide a high salary for people to want to do the job. Again, my therapist does it for less than my mom makes working at a farm. So. Um, get a business card. Yeah. <laughs> The other thing, uh, when my kids were in school, we had natural helpers. And do we still have that program? No. No. And they 
Bosnia. Um, that... It's uh, evolved into link through those kinds of things. But that again is someone maybe you can go mm -hmm. to, but not someone that can pro provide the depth of what. Oh, yeah. But they might help guide you to bring you to someone to help, not let you be by yourself. Okay. So we do that kind of modify. Well, it's a different program. Yeah. It's a different mm -hmm. program. But yeah, we natural helpers. I was part of that when I was a kid. Yeah, it was a great program. Long term. My, my kids both enjoyed it because they felt like they were making a difference. All right, you guys, anything else? No, I guess I just want to add, it's not because we don't want to hire um, people that can come in and provide those services. We do. We just haven't been able to find people that can fill those needs. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> speaking for myself, I would love to be able to find the right person to come in and, and fill those needs for us, Noah. Mm -hmm. um, I feel your pain. I mean, I, I I would love to have somebody on staff that can reach out to students that really, you know, those that you know, we we've all seen the kids with the long sleeve shirts and the won't make eye contact and and you know that they're sad. You can mm -hmm. see it in their yeah. their um, the way that they act yeah. um, or interact with others, but. Finding those right people to come in is really hard to do. Yeah. Um, so just uh, just adding on to I that. Know that you are loved. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know um, I would hate to have anything yeah. happen to you or any of these other. Yeah. Things. And that's that's the hard reality about this is that depression, anxiety, whatever you may have, it does not have a standardized phase. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't have brought this up, you guys probably would have walked right past me and thought, yeah, not a problem. You yeah. wouldn't have thought that I medicated twice a day to. Yeah. Keep myself sane. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's about all I have to say on that. I feel like we'd go ahead and talk about this possible help sure. for the situation we stood away. Great. Okay, so um, I talked to the board before break about um, an online service that would provide direct services mm -hmm. for students. Um, I, I, like I said before, I've been working with Megan Hope and Neil Ripplinger, and we've been looking to find grant money. You said the board is willing to fund and support that. Well, in our investigation, we've had multiple meetings. I've had our mental health staff meet with, I just don't think it's going to provide what we need, and neither does anybody else. Um, it's, it, they, once we really dug into it and found out it's school-based counseling and school-based, we already have that. That's what our counselors are. They're school-based counselors. So I would like to use the money to hire a licensed clinical social worker. I have a job posting ready. Um, this person would provide direct mental health and social emotional services for individuals and groups at the middle, starting with the middle school and the high school. And then I'm going to continue to work with Megan and Neil to, to, to be able to find grant money to add another one to you to, to, to uh, work with elementary. But I, the money that you said I could have, I would like to have for this instead. I, it's going to be better. The person's going to be here. They're going to work for us and they'll be here for the kids to see face to face, no online. Except for maybe in the summer, we could do extra days so they could do continue to connect with their kids in the summer, and that could be in person or that could be online. And what kind of mental health services can the they can provide do? therapy? Okay, social workers, licensed clinic, they can provide therapy for students, okay. which our counseling staff cannot, our school sites cannot. Are you looking at a full time basis or yes. a couple days a week? Full time, full time, five days a week, and it won't cost one hundred thirty thousand dollars. Not for this year, anyway, because we'll go. They would be on the content teachers contract. Um, they have to have a master's degree. They have to be licensed. They'll need an ESA, but we can work on that. Um, but they would be able to provide the direct services and be someone that kids can see. Sounds like it'd be money well spent, yes. as opposed to the. No, I think we need to throw every, everything we possibly can at mental health services in in every way. And and uh, both Eric and I have. There's some people out there we've talked to people. I think there's people that will apply for this job that are qualified. Will you send us a job description? Yes, I will. Yeah. But I'm I'm going to send it out. I had the counselors review it and and have them had some of their um, social work people they know in social work to make sure it matched. It's a it's a job description from some of, that I got from other districts that are hiring social workers and the ESC um, and with some edits. Um, so I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you tonight. Um, but I'd like to post it. Thank you.
And to add to that from a funding perspective, that the state is looking at um, funding as a group. So nursing, um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, counseling, social work, psychology, or psychologists. Um, there's a group that they're actually tracking the FTE. And if we aren't staffed high enough to need that FTE, they won't fund us. They'll actually take money back if we don't have those positions filled. Um, so I just started this this last week to look at where our FTEs are um, and do that analysis because we, our report is due. So, so we have to report on this three times a year to see where our FTE is. It's the only adjustment we make from an FTE um, reporting perspective throughout the year. Um, so so Kim Bolt and I are working on that. Um, it's due on the 18th. So we sh I, by that point, we should have an idea of where our FTEs are in comparison to what we're funding, what we're getting funding for. And then of course, you know, if you're willing to put more money, we can always have additional FTE, but we need to have that minimum FTE anyway. So they're gonna take money back. So um, this would align with that initiative. Yeah. Well, thank you, Noah. All right, anything else? All right, next on the discussion, or next is discussion items, and it's the Boys and Girls Club lease. Good evening. Hello. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I would love to kick us off just with a, a few uh, pieces and updates on this project. And then I think in your packet, you have a few materials. You have a response to the draft uh, district lease for the CTE building, as well as a letter of support for the project. First off, I just want to say I've connected with uh, school administration on this a couple times. Um, Matt and Deanna continue to be wonderful to work with, supportive, um, and it's really just a matter of finding how to make this work in a way that meets the needs of the district, but also works for the Boys and Girls Club to be able to invest considerable capital dollars to bring um, the building uh, up to the standard we really want it to be, to not only serve the kids we currently serve in a single facility, um, but to serve more kids with more square footage. So I think what I'd like to do if it works is really um, less presentation, more dialogue our way through this. But I think I would, for a matter of record, like to read a letter of support um, for this project and, and read also the signers on that. Just I think it is a good summary of the ask we've made of the district over the last six months uh, to collaborate um, on the CTE building and finding the next generation of life for that. So um, Prosser School Board, uh, the Prosser School District has been a great partner of the Prosser Boys and Girls Club since its inception over a decade ago. This partnership has allowed the club to serve over 1,400 youth to this point, with the opportunity to serve considerably more with future expansion efforts. This is an exciting past and a hopeful future. We wanted to collectively express our support for current conversations between the Prosser School District and the Boys and Girls Club. Although over 40 years old, the CTE building on the old high school campus is in a perfect location to meet the needs of the community and can be renovated into a like new condition that affirms the dignity of the youth served by the club. Additionally, repurposing this space represents good stewardship on the part of taxpayers, as additional expenses for demolition or ongoing maintenance are unnecessary. This partnership can ensure the club is equipped to serve more youth with quality and consistency. It is critical that a lease that both benefits the district and the Boys and Girls Club be finalized quickly, as there are fundraising requests and state grants dependent on finalizing this proposal. Most importantly, the lease should be finalized because it is in the best interest of our kids and our community. We are strong advocates for the expansion of the Boys and Girls Club in our community. It is what is right for our students and their families. Thank you for your efforts to quickly finalize the details to allow the CTE building to benefit the community for another 40 years. With appreciation, Prosser community members and advocates. And I just did want to share, um, you know, we did ping our, our advisory board and our capital campaign cabinet um, to, to sign on uh, for this letter. And so uh, I'll, I'll pass around with varying signatures on this letter would be Court Wyckoff, who's our um, campaign cabinet chair, Jeff Andrews, campaign cabinet member, Zebby Castilleja, uh, one of our governance board members, Beige Hall, advisory board member, Jeff Hall, campaign cabinet member, John Lefemina, one of our governing board members, 
Rob Mercer, campaign cabinet member, Keith Sattler, campaign cabinet member, Rachel Shaw, advisory board member, Pat Tucker, campaign cabinet member, and Bob White, campaign cabinet member. Um, this is an exciting project. Um, we do think the CTE building is the perfect location, and we would love to use tonight as a way of dialoguing through um, some of the concerns that the district may have with a lease with the Boys and Girls Club so that we can finalize that and move forward with confidence. So with that, I will just pause, and I'd rather uh, be able to answer any questions that the board or administration may have um, that will allow us to get this across the finish line. And Deanna, Matt, I don't know if you guys want to add any pieces just based on our conversations as well. Um, I would just say the, the, the language on the, the language on the lease agreement hasn't been drafted. Mm -hmm. um, what we what we have drafted or had had drafted by um, attorneys was a cover sheet. Mm -hmm. um, and so that basically kind of it tries to capture what that agreement would kind of spell out. And so, once we have uh, some guidance from the board um, about what should be in the agreement and what shouldn't be in the agreement, we can get that drafted. Um, Brian, we've, we've talked to Brian on a number of occasions about kind of what his um, hard, hard stops are in this discussion and then areas that we can kind of finesse it through or uh, you know, what does the district mean by this? What's the best way to work together and collaborate on this? So that's kind of what we're doing. We're looking for some guidance from the board to have a discussion. And then obviously there will be a full lease agreement that will be drafted um, for review at some point. So why did we switch from, from uh, Mumford to the other law firm? Uh, so this is Foster Garvey that yeah. we're working with. And so they specialize in property stuff. Bingo. Okay. Yep. And so everything from levies and bonds to uh, school district, public land, uh, lease agreements. Uh, so um, Sean, Sean Mumford, uh, Makey Jackson buyer out of Yakima is our general counsel. Yeah. And so they're able to advise the district on lots of different things. Uh, clear risk has a lawyer too that we sometimes work with. Jen Homer is her name. And so if it involves insurance, risk, and liability, we work with Jen. And then Abigail Westbrook at WASDA is kind of the person that we work with if we interpret policy. And so we, we have a number of different lawyers we've worked with in the past we've worked with. Um, oh, shoot. Patterson, Buchanan, Phobes, and Leach. Um, specifically Don Austin out of that group to conduct some investigations. Um, but by and large, general counsel, Mickey Jackson Buyer. This one, um, Foster Garvey, that's specific to levies, bonds, and lease agreements of public land or even public land sales, if we get to that point. And that was an initial conversation about would we lease it or would we sell it to Boys and Girls Club? What's the interest? Uh, how do we do that? Um, so. So what do we need to do to get the show on the road? I guess that's the short question. So there was only a couple things I saw at all that were even vaguely concerning. I yeah. understand why it's been. I'll let Brian kind of walk through um, his, his priorities in the agreement. And uh, like you said, we can kind of dialogue about that. And then um, the board can offer final direction. And I can take that back to to Lee and Lee can draft an agreement. So yeah, I think you know, looking at the the lease cover sheet, and absolutely, it is not a draft lease. It is just a, a conceptual piece that we can then build a, a lease off of. But there are some challenges in that from a Boys and Girls Club perspective, and it really comes down to an issue of stewardship. So at this point, the club is embarking on a multi million dollar capital campaign. We've made incredible progress on that campaign, with the goal of renovating. Um, a, a building lease with the school district to bring it up to like new condition. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges with the cover sheet is really around um, length of that lease and the ability for the school district to reacquire that facility 
um, with limited notice, um, which makes it really hard for us to invest multi-million dollars with three months from now that disappears, right? From a private donation perspective. And I think the real piece behind this and is the what is listed in here as a clawback clause. And that is very unique to Crosser School District. I have not encountered that um, with other school districts or municipalities, um, but I think it gets to the core of what's being proposed there by your attorney is that a district asset needs to be available for district use if needed. And I'm understanding of that, but I do think that is not a legal requirement. I think there's other ways to accomplish that. So what I proposed in here um, as a response to the district um, was a separate clause for usage in case of critical incident, right? Because the reality is if the district encounters a need where there's an emergency need to use that space, great, we can make that work. And let's write the lease in a way that allows that to take place. But what's very difficult about the way the cover sheet is written is very short lease terms with the ability to reacquire that facility at a moment's notice, regardless of how many millions of dollars have been invested in it by private donors. And from a private donor perspective, those that signed on to the letter of support, it's just not doable. So I think we can get there as long as we can change the structure so that uh, that lease is a longer term. There's confidence to invest private donations in that, but there's also written language in that lease that if the district has an emergency need that occurs, flood, fire, you name it, all those things we hate to think about as our primary mandate or your primary mandate is, is educating kids. We can work together and make that happen. Um, but what we can't do is, is invest multi-billion dollars into a facility that 90 days later could disappear. And I think the school board can appreciate that concern. Yeah, that would be absurd. I mean, that, I, no, nobody in here would sign a lease with an agreement like that, that you dump a bunch of money in and they can change their mind or well, I guess an emergency, whatever you want to call it. But well, actually, in here, I'm proposing an emergency clause. In here, it's just... Yeah. And I don't know that... We can get it back. Not legal. That's Sure. Legal. And so I think the, the attorney will take direction from the school board, right? And so if the school board, you know, believes in principle that a longer-term lease that allows for financial investment from private donations to benefit the youth of, Pro youth, the youth of Prosser, if the school district gives that mandate, we can come to terms on that, and it, it won't take long. I think it's just a matter of getting clear direction from the school board on it, how that asset can be used um, in partnering with the Boys and Girls Club and making sure that we structure it in a way that protects the district, but also protects private investment that donors want to make in the Boys and Girls Club renovation. Well, I would think there'd be like a percentage buyback. Yeah. The So we had talked about in the, one of the ways, kind of the one of the workarounds, I'll call it, for the recapture clause is is putting language in there about like an extended notification period and so if we had to use it if say we were bursting at the seams at some point we would have to notify boys and girls club two years out in advance or something like this and then beyond that that we were going to reacquire it. beyond that if they invested five million dollars and it, they weren't there to the um, to the maturity, then the district would have to reimburse at some some level. So they invest five million. They were in there for seventeen years, and we need the facilities back. We would have to reimburse them three million or something in that, um, so that they could you know start over and find a facility and everything else. And so those two pieces. Um, were, were a couple components that we had talked about within the recapture clause. Um, we had talked about this idea about 20 years from now, which is when we can start using it uh, in the K-12 facility again, because of the state match, we can't, we couldn't house students in that building and run classes out of it. We can do it for preschool students, but not you know, general K-12 bed. So, um, yeah, all that to say that 20 years from now, the Boys and Girls Club is an agency within our community will uh, almost in, you know, identity sake, that, that'll almost be their, their building. Um, if we think about students having gone through in 20 years of work out of that building, people will get to know it probably as the Boys and Girls Club. 
Um, yeah, I think the goal is to write the lease in a way where it, it leaves the district options if you need them in, in case of emergency and crisis in a fair and equitable way. But what you know, we are very much approaching this as a long term facility post 20 years facility. You know, I think a great template the, to put this alongside if you're looking for comparison purposes is the old Emerson Elementary School building in the Pasco School District, which has been um, our Pasco clubhouse for 24 years now. It was originally a 20 year lease. And, you know, here we are four years past that. And the city just made a, a million and a half dollar commitment to invest in that over the next year or two, not as a city building or a school district building, but as a boys and girls club, because that's how much value it adds to the community. And I see this as the same. Let's write the lease to give options. But the intention is really for the club to put down long term roots to not only continue to serve kids as we have been in a more efficient, quality and equitable way, but to serve more kids because of more square footage, um, because I, we do not like turning kids away. And that's happened too much over the last decade. I agree there, there should be, there should be a percentage buyback. You know, if you guys are going to dump a bunch of money into the building and something happens five years in and we absolutely have to have it for whatever reason to say you guys are out X dollars and you, you know, five years off of what your expected lease was. That's not fair either. So there has to be a something, some kind of buyback in there to go with that clause. As for the 10 years additional, uh, 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 the 10 years with the additional 10 to roll on, I mean, we can't do anything with it for 20 years anyway. So, I mean, we can. So then my preference would be a 20 year minimum on that. So. I have a random question. Yeah, please. And um, would this assume that the general upkeep would also fall under boys and girls club? So like, are you say yeah. like normal group, say 20 years or something? Sure. Years. But what would that happen? So, you know, say 20 years, we do take it back. Would the assumption be that it's falling apart again and then we have to reinvest all this money? Or would there be language that the boys and girls club would keep it up as if it was their own building so that if we did ever have to take possession of it, it would be in as good, if not better sure. condition? Yeah, I think it's a great question. It's a piece we'll have to hammer out in the, the actual lease language um, as who is responsible for maintenance and upkeep of the building during that lease tenure. My preference, and I think it would be the district's preference, would be for that to be the Boys and Girls Club. Yeah, and so it is at the end of the day, if 20 years came and they returned it and there was, you know, like the roof had, you know, the roof was bad again. It is at the end of the day, the district's property. <laughs> And so we're responsible for all, you know, even if it was like, hey, 20 years, thank you, thank you, we're going to go our separate ways. It, that's the, and so liability, the roof caved in on, you know, all that stuff, it's the district, you know, so it is still part of the district, even though we're working out an agreement. And there has been a history of, you know, like the white church. Sure, absolutely, uh, currently. So we've been working with the Boys and Girls Club to try and uh kind of allow facilities for you know their growth to seeing that our visions kind of run parallel so. thank you for that question i mean that risk management question is a great question right and so the goal will be to reduce liability and risk for the district during that lease period absolutely as it should be well and if, as we're having these capital project conversations mm -hmm. we have to know where where do we have to have a savings to replace things that sure Yep. Other questions, feedback? I have a perspective. Question. Oh, let's do it. Um, first one is uh, 1.10 East term. Okay. Do we anticipate what do we anticipate the starting date be? Yeah. So I think there's two ways to look at this. One would be to have it start as soon as possible, which is is really my preference, knowing that for a, a period of time, that would be an unoccupied facility as we did the necessary design work, finalized fundraising, and then did the renovations. So my preference would be to start six months ago. Um, and so that, that would be preferred. But if it needs to be delayed for a period of time, we can, but even executing the lease, if it even is delayed six months gives site control to the point where we can invest the dollars in the necessary design work and have confidence in our fundraising efforts as we continue those in the community because site control is becoming a question that donors are asking as they should so if we and i'm going to play devil's advocate here for a second yeah so if we sign this lease it says 45 days after publication whatever that sure is. um so say we're in the middle of february and you guys take possession of the building but we have Whitstrand 
we have some other, I think some other folks that are special service sure. are in the CTE building. How does that work if we lease a building to Boys and Girls Club, yet we're still working inside it? And we could just delay it till the end of your usage. So if it's better for the district to finish out the school year, great. But I would still like to execute on the document, even if the date is later, because once again, it gives that confidence in fundraising efforts and we can get in and do the design work so that come day one of non-district occupancy, we can swing a lot of hammers and knock down a lot of walls. So that was my big question. When I yeah, totally flexible to the needs of the district. Um, under services. Um, I'm going to do the easy ones first. We'll get to the hard ones. Um, uh, item B. Yep. Um, it says, Janae, we will provide access on all weekdays to the gymnasium, the youth area, and the field between the hours of 3 and 7 p.m. A lot of our community, um, we have a, I, at least I thought, think we do, have a, a pretty significant AAU program sure. that has struggled with gym space for as long as I can remember. Yep. Now that we have a new high school, we have two extra gyms, so we don't have to worry about high school teams. Um, but it was the hope that as an AAU coach and somebody that was part of the program for a number of years, that we that the high school gyms would open up and allow the kids that work, you know, that, that go to the Boys and Girls Club yep. now actually have a place to go practice basketball. Sure. So how would it work if if you have access to a gym or both gyms, it just says gymnasium. I'm not sure if right. it's NPR or if it's both. Uh, the intent when we did this was the adjacent gym, the main gym. Okay. So, so we would have still have NPR, but how do you do? You, do you do much between the hours of three and seven in the gym at KRV? So it, it's sporadic based on needs of the school and obviously timeline and construction and COVID and all these wonderful things, right? Um, but yes, the intention here, and, and we can hammer out those details in the final lease, is to have a time in which um, our club youth and staff could utilize that gym space during program time, but not be restricted to the point where it's not available for community use outside of that time. Now, whether that's um, you know three to seven or three to five or whatever the case is, um, we can talk about, but during program time after school, it would be beneficial for us to have access to gym space adjacent to the CTE building. Um, but we can massage what that looks like. And there's some seasonal demands on that too. Wrestling's the greatest example, probably. So the provide access, we didn't say that, you know, so it could be a factor of like scheduling. We didn't say that they'd have exclusive access. Okay. It's just that they would they would have the ability to sign up. Um, we've even we've talked about different ideas, whether that's a sign up list and if they want to sign up in advance um, and we would publish it or do a Google Doc or something. OK, um, if if it's a sticking point with the Boys and Girls Club, like a right of first refusal, but also looking at, you know, like the community, we do have community needs that we have to serve, too. And AAU and I mean, those are feeder programs to high powered athletic programs that we like to see within our community as well. And so um, just trying to work together collaboratively to fulfill everybody's needs. But proximity. So AAU usually comes after seven, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, they're not, I mean, yeah. you can't have three-year-olds or third graders go until nine right. practicing. So I, I, a lot I was of just, times we start at five, five, six for AAU yeah. and it'll go all the way till nine o'clock yeah. every night yeah. of the week. So I think we can definitely make that work, which is why it's there as a placeholder for us to negotiate our way through. Part of the value of the CTE building is location. For sure. So it's not only the district district facilities of gym and play field, but add to that library and park yeah. and it's a win. Yeah, I didn't mind uh, item A, which gives you the gym till 530. It was from, you know, uh, up till seven. So. Yeah, fair. <laughs> it's a good question that we can massage and make work for everybody. You know, literally one of the main concerns I had, too, because I know a huge part of the reason that, that people lobbied for the new school so we'd have more gyms so we could spread, you know, these kids. Some of the sometimes it was 930, even 10 for AU teams. Yeah, sure. So well, was... and right now we're not using the NPR because it has always has lunch set up in it. Mm -hmm. you guys currently, currently AAU has it every day during okay. um, from, from about five o'clock, like Andy said. So about nine. Um, and we also have uh, indoor soccer in the MPR. Oh, nice. And that's not occurring every day, but. Um, oh. And I, I think the boys wrestling is still practicing upstairs. If 
they, they go to state high school, school boys, high school, high school yeah. boys, yeah. 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 Them, and then we also have the um, youth wrestling program that has been practicing all year. Oh, the little guys. Oh, oh they. I didn't realize they practiced upstairs. Okay. Um, Sometimes superintendents practice. <laughs> Are any of the renovation dollars going to the gym or is going to be specific to the CTE building? So that's where the Boys and Girls Club will be Correct. and spending the money, but this is just access. Correct. Okay. Yep. Great clarification. Uh, next question. It says removal of portables located to the land west of the building. Yep. Um, I'm assuming the old weight room. The old weight room. Everything from basically the CTE to the gym. Thanks. Correct. And the reason behind that is, and I had to get clarification on this as well, and Matt reminded me of, Brian, this was your idea. Oh, yeah, it was. Um, so that probably, and we'll finalize this once we do design work, is really where probably that main entrance and parking lot will need to be put in by the club to service that CTE building. So in order to do that, those portables have to be removed. So this isn't a question for you, but I guess it's a question for us. If they're going to take the portables out, are those portables usable to a point where we they're they're demolition. They're just they like the ones that have years ago. They're, they're really okay. Yeah. There's a number of them. The, the portable ones were yeah. so bad. We've, okay. we've hung on to our portables for too long, a lot of them in the district. <laughs> and so, um, but once we get rid of them, we talked about the idea of a pavilion, mm -hmm. a parking lot. Yep. I mean, there's Bus a pull of, through. Yeah, yeah. All sorts of <clears throat> stuff that you could do. Um, with that space. Well, I was just hoping we could reuse them, but that's no, no. <laughs> um the next question is under maintenance. Uh -huh. Um the city owns does the city or the school district own the one by Keene River? Yeah, I can't remember. City owns that building. The city owns that building. So the White Church mm -hmm. um school district owns and it says landlord will provide custodial services and then tenant will pay for mm -hmm all costs associated with those services. Is that how it currently works now? Or is this, an, is this a new item? I think this is a new item based on the building um, that was proposed in the cover sheet. My preference would be to have the tenant provide custodial and maintenance services. Okay, so you, so that's good, okay. I, I Let's the, reduce district costs on this as the, much as we can. The, the middle school and high school kids would also be in the main club. They wouldn't know. Wholeheartedly, this is a comprehensive, no that's right. This is the goal is a comprehensive combined facility to take two programs, unite them together and serve even more kids with available square footage, absolutely. The reason why it was written that way is for the potential of the, the district to hire somebody who's quote part-time and who could actually be on site there but the boys and girls club would share in the cost of that okay and so we benefit from another i mean we've increased the square footage of the district with these new buildings and so our custodians are burdened and overburdened we've cut custodians mm -hmm. um so to have somebody on and to to build back or that that was kind of the okay. the premise or the idea behind that is that the district could actually hire a custodian, do some cost sharing, and that they would be full time, but we would use them a majority, and then they would also uh, service that building as well. But again, a lot of this is, you know, we can decide where we want to fall on it, and yeah. as long as it's workable on both ends. Uh, my last question. Is this the hard one finally, or is that still coming? No, actually, I don't even think I have a hard one. Oh, good. I'll take it. Um, is 121. Uh -huh. um, it, it basically deals with subletting the building. Um, and in and, and the language here, it, it just says we'll only comply with uh, school district policies. But I think if we're going to sub, if you were going to sublet it, I think it should be a board decision, not just based on policy i think the board should have final say if, if you're going to sublet it so yeah i think a lot of it might be that we need to dig deeper into defining subleasing that because there's a full spectrum between we vacate the building and sublease to somebody else yeah. um and then there's we have a group that wants to use it for a an event on a saturday so i think we want to clearly define that i think in the purpose of this for subleasing that's us vacating yeah. and absolutely that should be um you know, however you want to put grounds on that, because that's not the intent. The intent is not to provide a building for the Boys and Girls Club to renovate to then vacate. The goal is to provide a club. Okay. And so if that is deviated from, we are comfortable with whatever accountability you want to place on that. One of the things that came up um, 
in conversations, not with Brian, but with um, just, you know, like Clear Risk has been involved in this. There's a lot of interworking parts. Was it like a sub subletting for the purpose of like office space? Mm -hmm. So the Boys and Girls Club says, hey, we have extra space. Uh, there's a small business sure. or something. We can rent you a small office space and then charging uh, somebody else rent the, Got it. more than what the district is actually charging Boys and Girls Club. Mm. And so um, the the idea and the principle behind this is to spell out certain things. So if there's so that there won't be disagreement, right? Mm -hmm. We can say we were thorough enough in how we approached this that there is not. So after Matt Ellis leaves, that there's you know the new superintendent and the new board at that time doesn't say, hey, these guys didn't do a great job at this, mm -hmm. and no, now we're going to have to fight it out in court, um, and it, it'll be expensive for everybody. So. Other than that, I think I'm done. You know, I'm fully supportive of the Boys and Girls Club. Um, you know, looking at some of what you've outlined, I have I really don't have much of an issue with it. You know, kind of what you were saying. I mean, we can't use it really for 20 years anyway. Um, you know, I would I would hope we can move fast, you know, quick enough on this that we can have it before, you know, before us sooner rather than later. So I appreciate that. Um so how about this? The if the board has specific feedback, um, as I work with Lee on that, I can do that. Similar to the Pat Patterson agreement, which we actually need to loop back around with. Is the board okay with me working directly with Brian to come up with a formal doc? Brian and our attorney and and his people to come up with something we agree upon tentatively to bring back to the board for approval. I'm good with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, but you had proposed the 10 year before the recapture can be exercised as if we feel we need to include the recapture, which it doesn't sound like it's practical. If we can't use the building for 20 years, do the state funding because of our due to our bond, I don't know why we would include that in there. But if we well, feel like we need to, we can't use it for teaching space. Right. I mean, there's things right. that could be done that's irrelevant. I'm just, Sorry, no, just no, no, that's no, that's a good point. I would say that you know you had proposed ten years before the recapture clause could be included. I I would say ten ten to twenty. I don't see any reason. I think um, getting getting the money donated um, and using the building, the, the intent of the district, the board. I don't think would be like okay, well, one hundred twenty days. Thanks for putting six million dollars into that building. And now we have a great building. We're gonna. That's not what we want. And I heard. We all heard over and over tonight how much mental health services are yes. needed, um, the power of community, and we're stronger together. Um, and I think working and having a partnership in the community with the school district and the Boys and Girls Club only benefits kids in our community, which is what we are all here for. Yeah, I would support that. Thank you. So I'm, I'm fine with the 10, and I'm fine with the rolling 10 more on, but I still think to, to keep them safe, if they dump a million bucks in and we, for some reason, want it back in the first year that we owe them, you know, 900 or 800,000 or whatever, you know, there, there has to be a percentage language. Yeah. You know, when you go, when you buy a new set of tires, you go in, they check how much you've used up, they prorate them. There, there needs to be something. So if, if it's an absolute emergency and we have to, to claw back, then you guys are compensated, you know, reasonably. Uh, and it also makes us think twice about you know what we're doing as opposed to let's just go grab that quick. That's an easy space. So that's my opinion. I think I'm encouraged by what I've heard tonight. I'm encouraged by the questions and the support. I think what we have here is a win-win, right? And we should be able to get it done quickly. This is great for youth, uh, great for Boys and Girls Club service to youth, and great for the district. So um, I'm encouraged, and I think we can get this done quickly if we sprint here. So, so I guess I would urge any board member that has a, you know, if there's a deal break as part of this that you don't like, get a hold of that. Yeah, your voice heard. Otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, the, the, the other thing that in um, it's kind of in the sublease portion, but this is I sent um, a, a letter um, that 
Claude Zender had written. Um, so I just want the board to to be aware that um, Junior Miss, uh, they they would like us to think about solutions for them if we're able to, and um, kind of consider them as we work through this. And this may even be kind of that sublet language and when the, the agreement takes effect, um, giving them kind of some time uh, to find a new facility or decide if we can do something within the district forum. Um, but right, I forwarded the email on to you and you can kind of read that. But any feedback is good as Brian and I work through this and uh, we'll bring it back to the board um, for final approval. Cool. And just to add, oh, go ahead, please. I, I would ask if we could expedite this. I think we, I think Brian came for the first time in June, and we're in January. And if they could, you know, the, the faster they're there, the and done and built out, the faster we're providing more services to yeah. kids in this community. I agree. Are no catastrophes at Woodstrand. I mean, we should be that is good true. to turn it over That's like in June, hopefully. Also, we can add July, sorry. in there, like if they have occupancy before that, if there's a delay, then maybe we can delay it. Just don't execute it. We have that one time sure. that we're saying it might be. Delayed, yep. But just don't because it's going to take a long time for the renovation and everything. It's as long as we perfectly as long reasonable. As we, yeah. As long as we get an agreement agreed upon. Yep. That's. And, and let me add a piece just for, for the record on this as it pertains to partnerships. I think that's a critical component here as well. Until we get in, finalize this agreement, bring the architects in, there's, I believe, extra square footage in that building. And with that extra square footage comes opportunities to partner to, be, to better services to kids. So this is also a helpful tool in allowing us to then say, hey, here's the building. Yes, we're the primary occupant, but it doesn't mean there's not additional partnerships that can and should take place to benefit the kids of the district. And that should be explored as well. This will be a helpful piece to allowing that to happen. Fair enough. All right, let's hit it. Okay. Thank Thanks, you, Brian. Brian. Thank you, everybody. All right, guys, so we're on the consent items. Motion to approve. I'll make a motion to approve the consent items as presented. Second. I had a, I did have a question. Okay. Who was the second, Jason or Jeannie? Jeannie. All right, so got a motion, got a second. Any questions or concerns? Did we run? How are we using our nepotism policy? Are we checking to make sure everything's in place, that there's no issues that are violating the nepotism policy? We've got a hand. Th thank you, Mr. Gomez. I can answer that. Okay. I, I did not uh, hire uh, that particular person that's on, on, on okay. the agenda tonight. Um, Mrs. Dean hired that person. Mrs. Dean will also evaluate that person. I told okay. Mrs. Dean that I didn't want um, conflict of interest. Correct. So, uh, Mrs. Muski also works hand in hand with her, who's our special ed uh, teacher with that particular student. Now, when there are discipline issues with that student or anything, obviously I, I'm involved, but scheduling that, that kind of stuff, I said I want to stay out. Oh, thank, thank you for your candor, and that answers my question. I do have one more question now that you brought that up, and I uh, forgot. So, um, it looks like we'll be losing a security officer. Yes. Um, has that position been um, posted? Posted, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we I've have already a... tried doing some recruiting. I Do have too. <laughs> Do we have a sub right now? No. Yeah. We're actually down. Yeah. <laughs> the but... position is posted as well. So we have the sub position posted and now the other. Any other questions? All right, all in favor of approving the consent items, please say aye. 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 Which leads us to action items. We'll start off with vouchers and payroll. I'll make a motion we approve the vouchers and payrolls as presented. I'll second. All right, we have a first, we have a second. Do we have any questions? I had a few. All right. Um, and Amy, I appreciate you getting back to me on these. Uh, so one of uh, 906696 is for Comtech. Um, it's for radios for Housel. I think that's part of one of the invoices that we approved last 
summer september or le- earlier than that I, it was a while ago but they half of them came in right 15 of the 26. um and that's just for the middle school we also ordered them for one of the other schools so i don't have that off my head but we ordered them for so i know we we're supposed to get you pat a repeater that's been installed okay that was the one we received on the grant yes okay good um I don't know. Do you want to go through the rest of it? You want me to just read what you put? I, I can. Um, so nine oh six seven twelve is Craig Reynolds's um, contract uh, invoice or payment. And I don't know if you would like. You probably should speak on that one. Um. So he had done some additional hours for us. Um. For some of the the year end reporting, grant reporting. Um. He had an up to twelve additional days. The invoice that you that you have on tonight, Patrick, is probably the last one. I don't foresee needing his services anymore. It will still his the contract will still be out there through the end of the year in case we need to call on you for maybe in the budget cycle or something. But um, so far, I think I've, I'm to the point now that I can fly on my own. <laughs> so, um, and then the other question was about the um, the T-Mobile and um, invoice that was for hotspots. So we did get approved for funding this year, and it potentially could be the last year of funding for it. Um, and we are funded through June of 2023 for those hotspots. So we'll have to either turn. And I did, uh, Sean and I had a kind of a side conversation about that. So we do anticipate returning those. So if we don't have the funding for them, we're going to return at least the majority of them. And they are really nice. So when our um, district internet goes down, we can still have a couple because one hotspot can serve multiple devices. Um, but as far as we had them initially to give out to students and send home and everything during COVID. So we will start to reel those back and turn them back in after that funding expires. Thank you. I had a question regarding the election reserve fund expense 906700. I actually know that. So that's our portion of the um, election expenses. So every year, um, just looking at the invoice, we have a, a portion that we have to pay regardless of if we have anything on the ballot oh. or not. And that was our portion. For the, the general election in November? General, yes. Even though no Foster School District, no levy, no bond, no position? That was my understanding wow. based on this. Yes. Okay. And it's for government. Yeah, goodness. So, right. um, we have used the formula prescribed by the state auditor in December 1985 to figure the cost for the election. So, and then it, it has some more too, but that was, and I looked at it, looked at the percentages that shows that we had nothing, um, nothing directly for us, but that was our portion of the overall expenses. So when we do have an action out, we have to pay the portion specific to that action. Um, but then like the general, that's our, our share. <laughs> That's interesting. I can, I can board you the full invoice if you would like. No, Does that's good. Call? Your okay. uh, your summary was outstanding. <laughs> Thank you. No, I do have a question, Matt, um, regarding your tuition reimbursement. And I, I guess I, I'm going to kind of like fashion it on the conversations I think my grandmother and I had pretty routinely in college. And it was like, are you taking a full load? Are you spending all you, you know, are you spending my money wisely? And are you getting good grades? And then she would say, I don't, I don't pay for you to get a seat. So my question is, how many, how many, <laughs> Jeez, it's very specific about that. Um, so how many credits are you taking? Um, where are you going? And how many do you have left? Yeah. So um, I, I would have to get back to you on the credits. Yes, I'm getting good grades. Good job. Um, so yeah, I can follow up with an email to you and Jason um, on those details. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like me talking to my son. No, that was you're not there to go party. I'm not going to proceed. Remember those conversations? <clears throat> I know. <laughs> yeah, when you D equal degree in in my vaccine did not feel so much. Any other questions, guys? No, thank you. All righty. So all in favor of approving uh, vouchers of payroll, please say aye. 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 All right. Next is a school improvement plan for the middle school. 
I move to improve the SIP plan for Housel Middle School. Second. Okay, all in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 All right, so word of the bid for the Housel Middle School cameras. I'll make a motion to approve the award of bids for Housel Middle School cameras. I'll second that. All right, this was, I don't remember. I do have a question. So, Sean, thank you for your email explaining a lot of this ahead of time. So, that answered a lot of questions, but I still had one um, on the very bottom of kind of you broke out the two differences. Um, vendor history was one of the categories. It's on uh, bottom of page 88. Um, and I'll probably not even pronounce it, Ed, Ednetics. Um, according to the your headline, is they're the ones that put cameras here at the high school? No, uh, Fisher System is who did the cameras originally. Ednetics is who we hired to fix the cameras at, at the, the old high school. school. Sure. So, if you remember right, we started school last year, and they didn't work a lot of cameras. Yeah, and we tried and we tried and tried. Uh, we ended up uh, getting Ednetics to come in to fix. Our camera. Okay, but I, I was actually gonna. But they did. They did do the work for the old high school and Housel Middle School uh, on the original coax system. They did that as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I, then I won't badmouth them like I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> no, they they saved us, and they are doing wood strand cameras as well. Perfect. Are, and they, did they do? They didn't do Keen Riverview or Heights, though, right? That was a different, but same program that's running it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right. All in favor of awarding the bid, please say aye. 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 All right. Then the keynote speaker contract. I move to approve the keynote speaker contract with the. Uh, I don't remember where. Stu Cade. Yeah, Stu Cade. Second. And I'll be honest, this is the first time I've, I've heard of, of this guy. And I spent, I don't know, probably a half hour YouTubing everything. Um, and if anybody in the audience or online or you get a chance, it's pretty incredible. I was pretty really impressed with what he did. So, Mr. Denny, good job bringing him in. We're actually going to use some Title IV money for safe and healthy students to pay for him to come. And thank you for coming up with the, the money. <laughs> they they asked me for money. Can I find it? All in favor of approving the the keynote speaker contract, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> what are the times? I didn't uh, say. I don't remember. The uh, middle school will have a meet with our leadership classes in the morning, uh, but the assembly will be from 9 to 10. And then we'll probably um, buy a lunch or something like that along the way or meet with them and have lunch. And then he heads over to the high school, so I'm not sure what their times are. Uh, but he doubles up the high school and committee. I'll, I'll, buy, I'll, buy, I'll buy myself that. Yeah, I'll buy lunch for two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's going to be but this is the this goes back to our principals being proactive about some of the behaviors that we saw last year um, that we didn't want to have repeated, and so kudos to them. Um, Absolutely, commend them, commend them on being proactive. And um, yeah, we I think we've done a knock on wood, done a pretty good job this year about staying on those behaviors and trying to reduce the number of uh, bites, assaults, and everything else. So. This is part of that strategy about how we address it. All right. So next we have the Department of Children, Youth, Families, Regional Education Agreement. I know very little about it other than it has to do with the displaced kids and how we get them from where they are to where they need to be. 
Yeah, they, it's something the state implemented. We've always worked with them, but it's something that became a requirement to have this contract. It's been a few years, so we haven't always had this. Um, but it's just how we work together, how they communicate with us, how we communicate with them around students who might be in the foster care system. Um, they're not really great at communicating, but <laughs> we communicate with them. We've we've had to notify them of their foster care students before, but it's just I'll make a motion to approve the agreement uh, between the De Department of Children, Youth, and Families Regional Education Agreement. As presented. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did have all second, but I have one quick question. What what are the numbers like? Um, do we have a lot of kids that are living foster in care? Our this is foster care specifically. Mm -hmm. Um we don't have a lot. Um sometimes we don't have any, but we usually have a handful of students in the system. Um but some, but often we'll have them for a very short time and then they might be somewhere else. So yeah, we don't have a high number, um, but there, a lot of the services, the things that we do with foster care youth uh, outside of the stuff we do with DCYF is similar to what we would probably support homeless students, similar to that. Okay, like I said, I'm in favor of it all second. Yeah. I have another question though. Um, on heading five, to be on page 96, it has to deal with transportation. Um, I guess the second bullet point, you know, I think reading this whole contract, I think the the way it, it seems to spell out, you know, is like if, you know, a child is taken from the home for safety purposes and stuff like that, which I think is a traumatic experience. And I think this is good. However, part of it, and maybe you can just kind of clarify how this would work. If we had a student that had to be pulled out of their home and moved to foster care, let's just say in Sunnyside, um, it's not that far away, but it's a, it's a, it's a distance. If in trying to keep some part of their life normal, we want to keep them in the school. So I, I, I get that and it makes perfect sense. But how, how would we facilitate getting, if Sunnyside School District said, no, we ain't going to work for the Foster School District. They don't do that. They don't do that. Well, I'm just saying, I, and, here, and here's, I'm, this is what I want to play. We're short on bus drivers anyways. Yeah. Um, to say that it couldn't happen, I, I think it'd be tough, and I think it'd be hard for us to drive to Sunnyside to pick the child up, even though I think it's necessary. So can you kind of just... So, so there's actually several different things that happen. It's the same thing that... Ha it's a basically similar process to what we do with a homeless student or, a, or a, uh, maybe an unaccompanied youth who isn't living in fosters. So our transportation directors, my office and our transportation directors, we work with the other liaisons in the other districts and with their transportation directors. And so we have students we transport from Sunnyside. We have students we transport from Grandview. Often it's a meet. So like they, the Grandview might transport the kids to Blyles and then they hop on a bu our bus at Blyles and come into Prosser. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes depending on the situation um, we've had where we've reimbursed the parent or the foster parent mileage or between us and DCYF, um, the cost of the transportation is actually split between the districts. Um, with DCYF, it's a little bit different, but um, we've had parents that have said, well, I can drive them. You know, there there is no bus that goes to Benton City, or there is no bus that goes to Tri Cities. And we've had that situation before um, where a student might be displaced, like, and there's maybe a couple months left in the school year. In the next year, it might make more sense for them to go to school in Pasco than to transport, but let them finish the year in Prosser. Mm -hmm. um, it's really up to what, you know, between the parents, homeless, foster, care liaison, which is all, that's all me. Um, what's going to be best for the student. So often we, yeah, we just work with other transportation departments. It is, they, they do a fantastic job and even we figure it out, bus shortage or not. Okay, thank you. There was a young fellow got picked up on County Lane Road for like a year. Yeah. Benton City bus would meet the Prosser bus. and Sometimes a parallel exactly transport to a Prosser spot or yeah, we do whatever we can make okay. work to get them to school. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, all in favor of approving 
The Department of Children, Youth, and Families Regional Education Agreement, please say aye. 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 All right, next is the director, director bargaining and salary negotiations. I make a motion we pass uh, director bargaining and salary negotiations. No second. Any questions? I don't have a question, I have a comment. Um, you know, we're here January 11th, and I know this came before us before the first of the year. Um, but it, and, and I understand why we're doing it, but it sure be nice if we could kind of get these done ahead of time instead of waiting till December that we could look at, um, you know, doing it early in the year, whether we change the term um, of the contract or not. But I don't know. It just seems like we're pushing it too far into our current budget cycle. Not that it's not warranted. I'm just saying I think it's we're pushing it too far. I think stuff should be done a lot earlier. So I would hope as we move in, you know, into the future that we can start doing these in a more timely manner. Okay. Anything else? I, I did have a comment. Amy had provided to the board much more detailed explanation after we tabled it last time that it's the IDP and how it works with the state funding and that there's a chart to follow for these COLA incentives. And I think um, had, you know, that been explained previously and I think also having it earlier mm -hmm. to be on the budget schedule um, or, you know, information being in the, in the cover sheet that we wouldn't be here a second, wouldn't have been here a second time. I think that would have been good information um, to have provided to the board. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All in favor of uh, approving the director bargaining and salary negotiations, please say aye. 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 All right, that takes us to reports. First would be business manager. Right. So um, I know that there were um, concerns at Heights from the, the HVAC leak. Uh, so I did contact Clear Risk. They are going to open up a claim and reach out to a, um, I don't remember the term, but an environmental group to see if it's worth investigating or not. The repairs have been done, as what I've been told by Denver Boy. Um, so there, if they were to come in and test the air or test the walls or test anything, they probably wouldn't find anything. Um, but what the company is going to do is just going to review uh, the type of leak that it was, if there are any issues with exposure, and then get something out that we can share with the community, saying there's no risk, you don't have to worry, or, well, if you develop these symptoms, you should say something. Um, just so we'll have a claim out there, um, just in case. But given uh, now, knowing what we know now, um, it was a food grade and um, and we will cycle, and so there's really little to no concern with it, but we're going to follow the official steps to get that in the report saying no concern, and we can share that. Um, can I just interrupt you real fast? Yes, yes. I just want to make sure that everyone is aware that when it was leaky, no children were present. Like, I want to make sure that, that, was, that that's out there and that everyone knows that students were not in the room when it was leaking, when we saw the leak, like, it was before school. I just want to make sure everyone knows that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's really, it's, it's, a, it's not really a concern, but we don't want to disregard if somebody heard something. So, thank you. Um, we have received a number of donations over the last few months, um, whether it be at concessions, athletic events, like here's an extra twenty dollars or here's five dollars, and just kind of here and there. Um, we don't really have anything in place with the district to capture that, whether who it is and thank yous, and if we have to deny them, I would hope that we don't, but you know, we don't really have anything in place. So I'm trying, I'll put forward um, the, a policy that kind of maybe gives some language as well, how we handle those situations. Does it go to the club? Does it go to the person running the front gate? Does it go to general? Kind of what do we do with those little donations? And then also just to mention that we have had some for like student meal accounts. Um, we are receiving donations for the, um, calling it the kiosk, but for to transport the pictures from the old high school um, into the new, I'll call it kiosk here. And so we are starting to get donations for that as well. Um, and then also I'm working with the Booster Club to update our fundraising policy. You guys have seen it a few months ago, um, but I'm collaborating with them to make sure that we have the language that works for all parties involved. Um, and actually, Renee Martinez is planning to be here next week. Um, so at the study session, we can talk more about 
um, when do we allow certain donations and when do we not? When, you know, if there's a sponsorship volunteer or not volunteer, um, a sponsorship, a true donation, you know, kind of what our parameters are. We live in an agricultural area with wine and hops and, um, you know, we have a lot of businesses that want to donate to us and when can we accept that and when do we need to turn them away? I know that there's been conversation about that over many, many years. Um, personally, I feel like we're turning away donations, but then asking the community to pay for levy dollars, you know, it's it's contradictory. So um, if we can come up with something that works for the entire community, I think it would be better accepted. So anyways, I'm working on that. Um, I'll have a draft to you for the study session next week. And, um, and then a question more for the community. Um, we are in November, going to have to make a board resolution for the next levy. So we're two years out. We just are starting the newest levy and um, in January, but we have to approach the community for a renewal of that levy. What would you like to see? Um, what numbers do you want to see? How do you want numbers broken down so that I can prepare that in advance rather than a month before their election saying, hey, this is what levy would go to. Um, I think it's important that you get to the board members and let them know what you want to see and how you would want those dollars to be spent because it's a huge, it is a huge part of our budget. And we would have to cut a lot of programming if we are able to pass that. I know there was a lot of um, angst about it this last time. So I want to do whatever we can do to um, build confidence in the community to be able to pass that. So anyways, um, you can email me, you can come to my office, you can go to the board members, but I'd really like to start the conversation now um, over the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Mike was all around mental health, and we well, you already get it, huh? So, please, you well, know. thank you too. Yes, you're welcome. Matt, yeah. I just want to piggyback really quick on what Amy said about the levy. Um, that is a very important conversation, and uh, hopefully, our efforts about conservative budgeting will have paid off. Um, you know, staffing is around apportionment and there's a formula on how we get funded from the state. So we've tried our best to reduce um, in areas and run a more efficient uh, system. But that being said, um, we'll have to decide on a rate. And uh, that money is important. What we know to be true is that bonds and levies are passed months and months and even years in advance of that vote. And so getting the conversation started now, mobilizing citizens committees, um, starting to put our feelers out, building support and garnering support within our community, all that's important. So um, just start thinking about that. We did have a battle on our hands last time. Part of that I think was coming out of COVID um, and our, in the end our community responded positively. And so um, really working with them again uh, to, to try and carry out um, something similar, maybe we reduce it this time uh, in duration or the amount we're running. Uh, maintenance director position, security officer position. Uh, we're looking for those uh, to fill those two positions if you're interested in uh, participating um, in the interviews, please let me know. Uh, balance calendar, I've had a few different discussions with the union and internally. Uh, about about a balance calendar. I've sent the board some samples. Uh, this is the year-round calendar that people are discussing within their districts. And so um, I want to have a discussion about that. Um, we've been asked to have a discussion about that as a board and as kind of a leadership team to make a decision about if this is something right for the district. Of course, schedules are bargained uh, with the union. And so they're an integral part of this discussion. So um, moving forward, uh, please think about that. Um, it does have, I think it does have impacts on our students and families being a cultural community. And it does limit the amount of money some of our families can, their households can make. Um, so that that is a piece of this, uh, living in a rural agricultural setting. Uh, and then I've been working with Deanna and we'll continue to work on really solidifying um, the strategic plan and the compression planning that goes around it. So we're going to be looking at dates 
and times and the location and even the invite list. Um, Director Riley has let us know uh, kind of some draft picks that she th think would you know she thinks would be important in that discussion. So uh, we're looking for some input from other board members about who they think would be important uh, important community members to include in that conversation. Initially, we had talked about doing this on a Saturday, uh, kind of a full day Saturday and uh, trying to finish with um, some big strategic document or some um, pillars, as some people call them, like four or five pillars, everything from facilities to academics to leadership about areas that we could improve. Um, so we're just continuing to work on those areas. Uh, questions? Nope. Okay. If you have names, please send them to me. I developed, I have a spreadsheet and Lisa sent me a nice list. And I had asked before break, but people probably thought, forgot during Christmas break. So you could get them I to did. me. I really this week, if, if you could do that, please. I appreciate it. Yeah. Right, thank you. That was part of my, my board report. So I'll follow up on the strategic planning. If, I know that I started talking to community members. I think my list is like 30, yeah. 30 to 35 people. -ish. Around there. Yeah, I, don't I, know. I, I can get you more people. A good, good amount. We, we have to, um, you know, we also, we also don't want to get to, we have to include staff members, yes. administrators. We have a lot of, a lot of partners. Plus we also probably want to include some high school students. And so, you know, we don't want to be too huge <laughs> and possibly some of the names you said, we might be some of the same people. So, and I would just say, and I know we started, the conversation was that we would start the process in January. If we could just give everybody as much notice as possible, yeah. respectful of their time so that yeah. they can plan, especially if it's a Saturday or the weekend um, in the yeah. evenings, um, that, and that would be my request. Jeannie? Um, um, I didn't have a lot attended some of the basketball games, and I don't know if a lot of people go, but I've never been that people around us don't comment about what a beautiful facility this is, <laughs> you know, which makes you kind of proud. <laughs> yeah, and so Mustangs, they're doing well, <laughs> both of them, the girls and the boys. Yeah, that's it. Peggy? Well, I had a couple of things. One, I hope everybody enjoyed the new mural that we have out here on the wall, the Mustang mural. And um, it's it's absolutely beautiful and a real tribute to our school. Um, and then the second is that um, I'd like the board to consider uh, the um, participating in the online board self-assessment. We, uh, prior to... COVID and all the different changes that we've uh, gone through in the last couple of years. Um, we used to participate almost on, a, on an annual basis in an online board self-assessment, which um, I know Andy was a big part of that, and he probably can offer some input on it also, but it was, um, it was a way that, as a board, we could um, meet together and uh, we would all take an online assessment that was offered through WASDA, which is a board organization. And it would help us look at what our individual strengths and what we brought together as a team to, um, to the Prosser School District and, um, and kind of assess what those strengths were and then how we could use those strengths or build onto those strengths um, so that we could be the best possible board that we could be. And um, if, um, I mean, we could always, always use improvement. Everybody can use improvement on how we can do a better job of working together. Our common goal is to make the best decisions that we can for our kids. And um, I'm wondering if it's time for us to maybe look at bringing that back in. And uh, the way it works is we go online, we each take our tests, and then WASDA provides a person to come in, gather that information, come in, and then sit down with us and help us look at all that data and say, you know, this is working really well for you. And this is maybe some, if you tried some of these things, maybe it would, you know, maybe it would 
improve the way you're interacting together as a board. Mm -hmm. And so um, I asked that all of that information be sent to all of us so that we could at least look at it and that we could talk about it as a team. That's a good idea. If we were to tackle tackle that, maybe not next week, but like the work meeting next month or something, we could dedicate that to having them come talk to us afterwards. Because the the survey, well, it wasn't a survey. The questionnaire was only like 10 minutes, if I remember yeah. right, 15. It didn't take long, just a lot. And it's all anonymous. You know, obviously there's five of us, but yeah. it doesn't say, Jeannie said Andy's a you know, yeah. blankety blank. So it's not like that, but yeah, so, sounds like a plan. Yeah. Well, did you find it useful when we used to do it, Andy? Enlightening. Yeah, enlightening. <laughs> yeah. I think it's the Wapato. It was either the Wapato or the Mapped. And one of the comments from one of their board members was like, yeah, sometimes it's kind of hard to hear. But ultimately, it builds strength in your board when you can sit down then and talk about, you know, board relationships and how do we make ourselves stronger mm -hmm. as a group. Fair enough. I think we should look into it. Anyway, something to think about. That's a good idea. Thank you, Peggy. Jason? Yes, sir. Um, kind of to tag on to what Amy said in your report about the levy and, um, you know, some of the financial impacts of what the levy actually goes to. Um, I know I, I think I'd asked, and I'm not sure if you're ready to do that yet, but giving us a work session breakdown not only for us but for the community that that's here online to really kind of break that down a little bit so they you know maybe better understand specifically levy dollars versus you know kind of state dollars kind of what that that does so i am not ready um I, I need more time. Okay. Um, so next Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so fiscal special position starts half time starting tomorrow. So Tammy Seekin is going to be transitioning away. Um, so right now she's the admin assistant to Vienna. So I don't want to take away too fast either because she's a huge, you know, she fills a like huge shoes right now. Um, and that position is not filled. So we're going to have a slow transition. So I really just need more time. Um, I have the data. So if anyone wants data, I'm not trying to keep it. <laughs> I will share it. Um, but to get it in a way that makes sense for the community, um, I totally understand your uh, Maybe. request, and I definitely will do something like that. And I wouldn't mind spending a few hours on a Saturday, like, this is how you read a budget. This is how you read this document. This is what this means. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our apportionment document is public record. You can go on and pull it today from OSPI. And that tell it tells you what our FTEs are, what our funding is for those positions. It I mean, it's, it's a lot of great information. Most people would not know how to read it, though. Um, you kind of have to have the eye for it. And I have no problem sharing that training. Um, I'd love to do that. Um, I also want to be far enough in where, yes, I can show you and talk about historical data, but I also want to be prepared to show you what you want to see going forward. You know, so, um, and that's why I ask the community, like, let me know kind of what you want to see, how you want to see it. Do you want it in bar graphs? Do you want it in historics? Do you want a 10 year average? Or do you want to just say, what would the impact of this be? percentage basis, if we went 30% on facilities, 10% on this, you know, and um, you can frame budgeting in, in many different ways. And so I also want to kind of start the budget process at the same time I do that, if that's okay, just because I also need more time anyhow. No, that's and fine. I'm maybe, not trying to put you on the spot. <laughs> I'm absolutely not, so I would say like maybe March, mid-March, um, I'll try fine. to get something where it kind of goes over last year, but also can start the conversation for the next budget cycle, if that's okay with board. I think that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my next thing is um, I had Miss Groneveld, which she's she's here tonight. She uh, she let me watch a PowerPoint that she put together as part of a special ed project, and I don't know if she wants to talk about it, but I found it extremely fascinating because I know nothing about special ed or special ed law or how that any of that stuff works. And I would propose that, you know, perhaps we have that presentation at a, a future uh, study session. Kind of gives a high level. I don't even know what it's a high level of, but. It was basically, it was for a class I was doing on, on um, educational law. And I had to pick a topic area and I chose special ed because I did in that area. And it's, it's a brief synopsis, like 12 minutes, I believe, just a, a bird's eye overview of what is special education, how you qualify, what it involves. Anyways, 
So hopefully we can maybe visit that in a yeah. work session in the future. Um, my last thing is, have we always had meetings on Wednesdays? No. No. Yes, we do. Yeah, it was Tuesdays, but then it was, it was uh, Tuesdays. What yeah. did it, it coincided with something. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we, we had switched it to Wednesdays. We, there was some flack there about Wednesday being a church night and a family night. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, we can, we can change it back. There's a, we just have to pull the policy around it and, um, you know, change it to reoccurring nights or, or different, you know, Tuesday, well, Wednesday, Thursday, yeah. whatever nights. And, the, and that's the kind of the point, you know, usually Wednesdays were left open for community and family and, and youth group type activities. I'm hoping we could evaluate that going forward um, to see if we, there's another day that we may um, be able to change it to, to that way all of our community that's not tied up into those activities has the chance to to be a part of this. So Tuesdays and Thursdays are great. The issue with it is that in the winter months, you usually have athletics, basketball, wrestling um, during those. We also used to get some... Um, some complaints sometimes because we conflicted with city council. Yeah, and that's Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. So I, it was just something I thought thought I'd bring up that maybe we yeah. could evaluate it sometime. Yeah, in the definitely. Um, what what I would propose on that is, um, you know, we could we could do an online survey to say if we were gonna and just put it on the website for anybody who wants to answer it. You know what? What day of the week is most convenient for you? If you were going to attend a board meeting, mm -hmm. and um, board members can get on it, community members can get on it, anybody can get on it and say, "Oh, I like, I like Fridays at five o'clock." <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then we could once we have that data, we can bring it back to the board and uh, have a discussion about that. Do we want to change it? Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Well, the mural is awesome. Uh, I was at the wrestling meet last Thursday or whatever and showed my wife, and it's really, really cool. Yeah. But, you, you skipped me. No, I didn't. You oh. started. I no, right there. <laughs> Alisa started. That was just like, oh. All right, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple things. Next week, we'll be still planning to do the superintendent evaluation as an executive session. Yeah, Is that the plan? You okay. Don't we finish with an executive? Uh, no, not tonight. Oh, okay. No, 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 not tonight. On the twenty, whatever it, next meeting. Okay. Yeah. So I talked about having a discussion about fundraising policies. So if we could keep the rest of the agenda on the lighter, the lighter fare, so we can focus on the evaluation. Um, I, would you prefer that I move that back another meeting? It doesn't have to be at the next meeting. I can push that back. If you already have it scheduled, though, and Renee has a plan, I, I would leave it up to everybody else what they would like to do. I think it was just that policy, and I mean, it oh, can't be that. I didn't, I didn't know if there's, I don't want to push other, you know, if there's other more pressing topics that we have to bring up. Um, I can, I guess we'll, we'll see where the agenda falls at the end of this weekend. If I have to okay. push it, that will be why. If it, you know, I don't, to keep the agenda. Okay. I know I'd emailed. It was before Christmas regarding the legality of continuing to use non-disclosure agreements and hiring because there was a change in the law in March, and I didn't know if we had if there had been any follow up with Sean Mumford regarding the use of those. Um, I haven't yet, but I will. Okay. And then my my last it's kind of sad. Um, I don't know if anybody else was aware that Mr. Rainey, Jim Rainey, had died in the last oh, week, and he was you know thirty thirty five year teacher of the Prosser School District, pro member of the community. Yeah. Do you still live in town? He moved um, a year ago. He was aware of his of his illness, and he spent time with all his daughters in the last year. All right. We good now? Yes. Sorry, I, I really honestly thought he just jumped in. And... I didn't think you were really skipping me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that was all I had was just talking about the mural and the wrestling match. So with that, the future meeting, uh, our next regular meeting, or no, excuse me, study session, uh, January 18th, 7 o'clock, right here. Thanks. And that will conclude our meeting. Have a good night, guys. It will be a special meeting, right? <laughs>